Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Karen can't cope with waiting more than two minutes. The second story, Entitled Driver hits me with a tree, blames me for his totaled car, and then throws my belongings off a cliff. The third story, the elevator technician taught the annoying woman a lesson. The first story, I've been waiting three whole minutes. So as a lot of people will know, pubs opened on the 4th of July in Britain. Due to the pandemic, they've all been closed for months and can only open as long as we follow the government rules. Our pub used to run as most do, with customers entering, walking up to the bar, ordering, paying, and waiting for a drink, and then choosing where they want to sit. The rules now are that all customers have to wait to be seated by FOH and have their details taken. We have to then do waitress and table service, and after the waiter has taken the order and payment, we get a ticket at the bar and start making drinks. The waiter then comes and collects the drinks and takes them to the customer at their tables. Customers are not allowed to come to the bar, stand at the bar to drink, or walk around the bar from table to table. What with it being the first day of business, we weren't sure what to expect or how many staff we might need, so started with two bar staff, one waitress, and one member of staff acting as FOH. We also had an app made with a booking system so we wouldn't get too overwhelmed and could stick to the rules of limiting the amount of people in the building at any one time. The day started off fine. The GM, myself, and another bar staff member opened up, over-prepared, and went through the plan of action for the day. The waitress came in and then we started our day. The majority of the customers were lovely, happy to be out, and patient knowing that the pandemic meant everything was different for pubs and bars. They even appeared to be giving correct contact details and taking the whole thing quite seriously, as they should do. We didn't have any Mickey Mouses or McLovins. That was until Karen came in. Her friend had booked a table for two. We have a booking deal. They pay five pounds per person to insure the table and then get a free drink. The selected drinks are usually more than five pounds. They spent a good five to ten minutes choosing their first drinks. We made them, the waitress took them over, everything was fine. However, me and the GM had already made eyebrow moves at each other to indicate Karen alert. The waitress also noticed, explaining how Karen had been short with her when ordering, but gave Karen the benefit of the doubt, saying she thought she might have been interrupting Karen and the woman's date. Roll on the second round. The bar was now getting busy, almost filling to capacity, and still with just me and another working on the bar. We were mixing drinks as fast as we could, but anyone who makes cocktails knows you can only go as fast as you can shake a Boston. As soon as one ticket was being completed, another four were being printed. The GM had also started taking orders, as the waitress was getting a bit overwhelmed, but that just meant double orders were coming in for us. Karen ordered a bottle of wine. Okay, cool. So I find the correct wine, get waitress to check it's the correct wine with Karen, and then uncork it. The waitress comes back to the bar. Karen's changed her mind, doesn't want this wine after all, decides to get a glass of something else instead. Fine. A few minutes later, GM comes over stressing. Where's her order? She says she's been waiting an extortionate amount of time, starts to berate me a bit because I as a manager should be faster and should be keeping an eye on tickets and my staff etc etc. I asked GM what the order was. Karen had ordered two complicated cocktails. Okay, fine, we're a little backed up. I look through my tickets and speak to my colleague. We haven't made it yet. I look at the ticket machine with the three tickets that had not long printed. Her order was there. She had placed the order literally three minutes before complaining. I showed my manager and also showed her the two tickets I needed to make before Karen's. My GM smiled and apologized. I knew she was just stressed and told her it was fine and I'd get to Karen's ticket when I got to it in order. My GM asked to try and make it fast as Karen was now loudly complaining to anyone that would listen, which was basically no one as everyone was just trying to have a good time and can see we're slammed. Karen waited maybe a full eight to nine minutes for her two cocktails to be made. Two different ones, both with quite a few ingredients, when we were at full capacity. She still moaned about the wait when she left, as she had other important things to do, said the service was bad, and she was in a rush, and why didn't we understand that the customer in a rush should be served first? Like I give an SH, don't drink fancy cocktails before you do stuff if it's so important. I finished my 8.5 hour shift. I hadn't eaten, hadn't sat down, had only managed to pee and smoke once all shift. Had a sanitizer station fall off the wall and cover me in hand sanitizer, so I spent the second half of my shift with half my chest and one arm all damp and sticky, while it dried, and made zero tips. I walked home glad I had worked the early shift, ate the salad I had packed for my lunch, and passed out on the sofa ready to do it all again the next day. The second story is, 
Entitled driver wrecks his brand new Dodge Charger, injures and then blames me, a pedestrian for his wreck. I work for a subcontracting company that does really niche IT work for various municipal governments, and my truck is loaded with equipment for computer repair and road work. Like I said, it's niche, but this becomes important later. As such, I currently have a two-hour commute, and while I do use the interstate during the day, I usually head home closer to midnight and prefer to take state highways and back roads due to the lower speed limits. Me, OP, Brad, the entitled driver, fake name. Renee, my fiance and coworker, fake name. Nice GF, Brad's female companion. Chad, Brad's absolutely chill father, fake name. Now for the story. So as Renee and I were driving home tonight, we had noticed that a large rotted poplar tree had become uprooted and fallen into the road, covering both lanes. Normally I would have called local officials and then either waited for the tree to be removed or simply wait for them to arrive and then take a different route. Unfortunately I had no cell reception in this area, and rerouting would have added an extra hour to my already long commute. As such I figured I'd try to use my demolition hammer, the best thing available to me, to try and at least weaken it until someone came by with cell reception that we could flag down and get to call local authorities. So I turned on our hazards, turned on our beacon, and Renee and I both put on our reflective vests and hard hats with built-in lamps. While Renee brought the tools over to the tree, I began grabbing the traffic cones to block off the road. Enter Brad. As I finished setting up the cones behind the truck, Renee began handing me the cones to put in front of the fallen tree. No sooner had I begun reaching for them when we heard the roar of a brand new Sunrise Orange Dodge Charger RT flying up the back road with a 30 mile per hour speed limit at highway speeds. I ran in front of the fallen tree, shining my flashlight on the already well illuminated tree and tried to flag down the charger. It was no use, he never even hit his brakes. I drove out of the way at the last second as the charger plowed into the tree, turning it into a horizontal fulcrum and me into a baseball as the tree struck my shoulder and launched me about 10 feet. I got up, extreme pain throughout my left side and unable to raise my arm up. Adrenaline coursing through me, I ran, uh, hobbled quickly to the remains of the poor obliterated charger, now smoking and leaking fluids all over the road. Miraculously, Brad and nice girlfriend, both about my age early 20s, got out and were completely unharmed, though understandably shaken. Renee, who miraculously found the one spot with coverage, called emergency services, and nice girlfriend called Chad. That's when I heard it. Brad. Oh God, my car, how could this happen? Why does this always happen to me? What would? And that was when he looked at me, looked at the clearly uprooted tree and proceeded to have a unique reaction. One that I never thought really ever happened. One that sounded like Brad. <laughs> me, thinking maybe he's injured too. Dude, are you okay? Brad, no idiot. Because of you, my car is completely totaled. What kind of moron cuts down a tree in the middle of the road? Me. Actually, the tree was already here. We only got here maybe two or three. Brad. BS, you blinded me with that flashing strobe light. Pointing at the yellow hazard beacon on my truck, which I've used for years. Nice GF. Actually, I think that- Brad. Shut up, all of you. I'm gonna sue you for failing to illuminate the tree properly. This is irrelevant. Me trying to be nice. Well, actually, that's- Brad. If you open your mouth one more time, I'm gonna- Renee, in all of her four and a half foot glory. Enough! It's not his fault that you clearly acquired your driver's license in a Happy Meal. That tree is very well illuminated. You clearly weren't paying any attention and you heard him. Look at him, he's limping, idiot. You're the one who ought to be apologizing for that stunt you pulled and the mess you made. Silence. Deathly, unnerving silence as Brad stood slack-jawed and making a strange coral noise. Suddenly, Brad goes on an absolute rampage, kicking and throwing my cones, tools, and various other items from and around my truck, into the forest and off the road's 15-foot embankment. I wish I could tell you more, but it was about that time that Chad arrived along with first responders. We gave statements, and I spent the rest of the time being checked out by EMS. I'll update you tomorrow after his insurance company calls me. And the last story is, I need that elevator now! So I'm an elevator technician. When they break, I'm the one who fixes them. When parts wear out, I replace them. The other day I was on a job replacing a worn out emergency light. Back in the day it was a habit to use the battery of the emergency light to power the elevator's siren system. Modern emergency lights have different voltages, being LED, so I can't use the old way of connecting everything. So I have to wire everything up from scratch, including new battery and siren. No big deal, but it takes a little longer to complete the task. Note that this is a three-stop elevator, ground floor, first and second. 
I start with hanging up all my out of order signs and start working on the ground floor. Five minutes in, just disassembled the old piece. The story begins. In comes the entitled woman. Mid 40s can walk perfectly fine, carrying one barely filled grocery bag. Me, yours truly. EW, entitled woman. D, her lovely daughter, around 15 years old. EW, excuse me, is the elevator broken again? Me, not exactly, ma'am. I'm changing this, showing her the new emergency light, because the old one wasn't working anymore. This will probably take about an hour to complete. At this point, her daughter walks in. EW, how am I supposed to get my groceries upstairs? Me, getting annoyed. I looked at her bag and give her the are you effing kidding me look. D, mom, seriously, take the stairs. It's two floors. Clearly annoyed. EW, no, I pay for this elevator and I need it now. D, uh, I'm going up and takes the stairs. EW, how long is this going to take? Me, like I said, ma'am, about an hour. The woman then sits her A down on a bench in the hallway waiting for me to finish. Really? Oh well, I do my thing in the cabin, not hurrying at all, mount the new E light to the ceiling, and pack my things to go one floor up to start the wiring on the top of the cabin. EW, you done yet? Me, no ma'am, I still have to wire things up on top of the elevator. EW, no, I can see you're done, you're packing your things. Me, yes, I have to take my bag one floor up so I can start on the wiring. EW, can't I use it now? Me, no ma'am, you can't. There's exposed wiring up there. If you use it now, you can cause a short and you'll get stuck. It's really not safe. EW, fine. And she sits back down on the bench, seriously peeved off. I take my bag and make my way upstairs. As soon as I stand in front of the first floor door, I hear the door on the ground floor close. And sure enough, EW went into the elevator and tried to take it upstairs. Heck no, I wasn't having that. I take my emergency key, and as soon as the elevator started moving, I open the lock, cutting the safety chain, and the elevator comes to a sudden stop. This scared the SH out of her and she screams. I open the door, and in my most fake surprised voice I yell, Oh no, what have you done? While calmly pressing the emergency stop on top of the elevator. Yep, this thing isn't going anywhere soon. Me, this is exactly why I said the elevator is unsafe to use now. I'll do my best to get it working again ASAP, but you made a mess up here, so I don't know how long it's going to take. There was no mess, but I couldn't resist teaching her a little lesson. EW swears, yells, makes a scene. Me, I'll be right back. Have to go to the engine room to see if I can get it working again. I close the door and make my way up. On the second floor, the daughter came out of the apartment because of the yelling of her mother. I quickly explained what happened. D raising her voice. Oh no, please get her out of there. But then she comes closer and whispers to me. Don't hurry, make her suffer. That's my kind of girl. Music to my ears. I smile, give her a thumbs up and make my way up to the engine room. I call my supervisor to explain the situation, in case she files a complaint. In the engine room, I start playing around with the fuses, putting her in the dark, because yeah, I haven't connected the E-light yet. I play with her for about half an hour, before I turn off the emergency stop I activated. The elevator synchronizes to the lowest floor, and I wait for the doors to open. Me. Please, don't ever do that again. EW white as a sheet, shaking. No, I won't and she takes the stairs and goes inside. I never heard from her again. I calmly finish my job and leave the building with a smile on my face. Mission accomplished. I hope you love this story. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.